Hi, welcome to Going for the Critique. My name is Jasmine Pickens, so let's get started. First is that it's important to roadmap your arguments. Not every critique is the same, and so it's important that you know the theoretical elements of your argument and what that will require for debate arguments. There's a difference between the book that has all the information in the world that the author had that was not in the context of debate, just in the context of different phenomenological, sociological, and historical uh, conjectures, but rather how you are connecting that to a debate round. Knowing the different kind of theoretical implications and grounding it in the link debate, the framework debate, the theory debate, the alternative date debate, the permutation debate, all of that is going to be helpful for how you incorporate your own personal voice and innovation into critical style debate. The next thing is that you need to map out three different two and R's during your prep for the season, but also during your prep in between tournaments. This is because a lot of the times two ends at the end of the debate, there's a lot going on, a lot of moving pieces. And if you've not already conceptualized the two and R that you want to go for, it's gonna be harder to, to do the backlog work, to work from the back and to try to anchor what is the vision, the purpose, the goal of the two and R speech. Additionally, uh, this will help you understand what it is that you have to win in order to make the arguments that you're making and the things that you can lose, uh, which saves you time ultimately, because now you are being very concise and functional about the two and R that you are um, giving in rounds. Now, the different components of the critique, I've got five, there's the overview, theory of power, if applicable to your critique, like I said, not all critiques are made the same, framework, links, slash the permutation and the alternative. Now, let me move my little, my, my face so that y'all can see what's, ooh, made myself bigger. That wasn't the goal. Okay. There we go. So the overview. Oh my goodness. This should not be too convoluted especially if you are tackling this theory debate afterwards, i.e. having a robust defense for uh, ontology or psychoanalysis and responding to affirmative contingency framing or psychoanalysis non-falsifiable. And so don't get too extra with it. The reason why is because the goal should be to ground the thesis of your argument through a comparative calculus of the affirmative's impacts with calculus, internal link chain, how the affirmative is deductive reasoning is premised on something that K is critiquing. You want to make sure that every word you are using has a function and a purpose. This is going to help when you are block writing because you're going to find that a lot of the words that you are using are either A, unnecessary, B, redundant, or three, getting up in the way of you making your larger application to the debate round. Now, some questions that you should consider while you're uh, putting together your overview. One is, does the K turn the F's impact? How? Does the critique implicate the F's ability to be evaluated? How? What is the significance of the K's implication? I.e., what are the impacts to the K? And how are those getting compared to the affirmative's impacts? These are the central questions that your overview must and has to tackle, right, in order for the judge to understand how to consolidate these larger theoretical claims into functional components in the round. Now, theory debate. This is both the most underutilized and overutilized portion of the debate. I say under because a lot of the times 
theory, the, the theory portion doesn't end up saying a lot of substantive things to help aid your argument uh, most of the time. It ends up being, and I had at the very end, an unnecessary flex of words and just a diarrhea of the mouth. I say over because this portion of the debate ends up having a robust word economy. So it's like you said a lot, but you said nothing. And then there's an over-prioritization of saying a lot. We need to be effective, but there is beauty and innovation in the, in, in the ways in which you are applying, the ways in which you are moving in and out of the game. That is where a word economy and you're able to really kind of get artistic with the way in which you go for the critique. Next is the theory debate can be embedded in your overview as the top layer thesis of your criticism. Some people like to separate overview from theory of power, ontology, psychoanalytic claims of the um, critique because they want to tackle the line by line of ass responses to that. And sometimes people embed it into the overview as kind of a further defense or kind of robust support for the assertions and claims that they're making about the ways in which the affirmative risk calculus inductive reasoning operates but it's really up to you just make sure that you have both and that you're trying to apply it and connect it to those central questions that i had mentioned above but to debate um so yeah and make sure that you are responding to the affirmatives kind of contingency, non-falsifiable, ontology to totalizing arguments. That's the time where you can have some really good line by line to consolidate that debate um, writ large. The next is you need to have a defense of your theory so that you should that should take priority over the bells and whistles of K-talk that are, like I said, an unnecessary flex. Next, framework, my favorite. So not every K is as framework dependent as others. For example, the cap K won't be as intense on framework as an anti-blackness critique or postmodernism critique. That is because the cap K is materially closer to the affirmative than more ontological and post-structural criticisms. Um, and so the amount of connection and the amount of immateriality um, of the argument is less and therefore the framework argument is needed less, but still needed to make arguments for why the threshold for holding the affirmative accountable for capitalist undertones is necessary and important in its application to, like I said, debate. Now, the purpose of framework, why do we have it? It's to lower the length threshold. The question of, well, how much of this link, how significant does the link need to be to the affirmative framework reduces that threshold down so that all you have to win is why the, the focus and priority of the scholarship and understanding debate through the lens that is um, preferable to your theory is the base, is the a priori, and therefore everything follows from that. You need to hold the affirmative accountable to the interpretation or the counter interpretation that you set. It needs to be functional. It needs to have a point. A lot of the times I'll see counter interpretations that I don't necessarily see after the 2NC um, or see how they're being laced within the rest of the 2NC speech. And that is one of the big, 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 um, not I won't say failures, but mistakes that 2Ns will make. You need to hold the F accountable, but you also need to have a role for that interpretation and implicate it back into how this is going to affect how the debate should be evaluated. A little bit more on that later on. You need to, you must, you have to implicate fiat. Now, we've all, you know, made jokes about whether or not fiat is a good ideological tool, whether or not it's a good heuristic. 
but is a debate that is very important for the criticism and should not be assumed to be responded to by just entering the critique in the chat. You need to explain the relationship between the interpretation and how you are implicating fiat with that. How is the affirmative's use of fiat problematic or uh, denies uh, the role and method of what debate ought to look like and should be centered around certain questions? Why is their use of fiat antithetical and mutually exclusive with that? You need to create a clear directive to the judge for the role of the ballot. This will be, t be potentially helpful if you end up deciding to not go for alternative solvency. All right, you've read the critique. All right, I say that the affirmative, like you get your link arguments, but what does that mean for what the ballot is able to be a referendum on? How should the judge um, understand their ballot or their endorsement doing anything material or if it's not doing something material what is the kind of directive the schematic the just the infrastructure right for what that decision what that model looks like at the level of the ballot this is so important and i think people just kind of throw roll the ballot without really kind of substantiating it with like a metric for analysis but you need to put metrics on what the ballot means in the context of your framework argument. Next is don't ignore the standards debate. Throw in some additional framework link arguments that force the app to spend more time on this part of the debate. Because like I said, especially if you're not end up going for like um, an alternative or you wanna go all in on the framework debate, substantiating more link arguments on the standards portion allows for you to have independent offense that you can just go for outside of just the link, the link story proper. Links, we love them, we love to hear it. So I have decided to categorize links in two different ways. Um, there's theory links and then there's functional links. Knowing which are which will be helpful for putting together different negative strategies and goes back to how you're setting up the different uh, two and R approaches that you wanna take. Theory links. They rely heavily on your ability to win the framework debate and should be distinct from the overview theory work. Did you hear me? I do not think that the effort, like the overview that you just gave should sound very, 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 very similar in terms of all the structural explanations of the world to the first link argument. It just sounds like a continuation of your theory, which you should hear as redundancy. You have not made a kind of nuanced, differentiated argument. It does need to be connected but the theory links need to have some distinction from the overview to show that you are working in the particular deductive reasoning of the affirmative um, that you are critiquing. Uh, next is functional links. These apply to either the implementation of the plan, I put plain, it says it means plan, leave me alone, uh, or closer in critiquing the internal link chain reasoning of the 1AC. It's not as framework dependent because in that world, you are allowing the affirmative on some level to weigh, to get to weigh their impacts. But this is where you are being more, you are implicating more of the 1AC evidence, which you should be for, even for theory links, but in the context of um, creating deficits to what the affirmative usually would preach as radical progressive policy, you reading lines of the 1AC as no, it's not. And so this means that the way in which the plan would get passed would be X, Y, and Z proves our, you know, um, argument for why, let's say, uh, criminal justice reforms are inherently parasitic on black communities. That is more of a material link. And if you have questions about that during our Q&A, please ask 
because I will gladly, gladly spend some more time here for the distinction between theory lengths and functional lengths. The perm, I'm trying to get through this, y'all. I know you got things to do, so I'm not trying to keep you too long. All lengths are dissets to the permutation. Um, but lengths function as disads to different types of perms. This means that you just can't group all the permutations together and think that you have responded to everything because some of your link arguments, if we understand it as theory and, uh, sorry, yeah, theory and functional, rely on either a larger robust defensive framework or a less defensive framework. And that's gonna implicate how the affirmative is going to um, approach or is going to portion out their offense and defense in the context of um, whether or not the plan is mutually exclusive, how much of the alternative is able to solve, how does that resolve the impact level if the affirmative is able to get access to their impacts, but if the affirmative is not being given access to their impacts, and it's a question of, you know, the larger kind of pedagogical value of the affirmative, what role then does the permutation um, make sense for? Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs>